Book 18 You talk one way, objects our adversary, and live another. You most spiteful of creatures, you who always show the bitterest hatred to the best of men, this reproach was flung at Plato, at Epicurus, at Zeno. For all these declared how they ought to live, not how they did live. I speak of virtue, not of myself, and when I blame vices, I blame my own first of all. When I have the power, I shall live as I ought to do. Spite, however deeply steeped in venom, shall not keep me back from what is best. That poison itself with which you bespatter others, with which you choke yourselves, shall not hinder me from continuing to praise that life which I do not indeed lead, but which I know I ought to lead, from loving virtue and from following after her, albeit a long way behind her and with halting gait. Am I to expect that evil speaking will respect anything, seeing that it respected neither Rutilius nor Cato? Will any one care about being thought too rich by men for whom Diogenes the Cynic was not poor enough? That most energetic philosopher fought against all the desires of the body, and was poorer even than the other Cynics, in that besides having given up possessing anything, he had also given up asking for anything. Yet they reproached him for not being sufficiently in want, as though forsooth it were poverty, not virtue, of which he professed knowledge. Book 19 they say that Deodorus, the Epicurean philosopher, who within these last few days put an end to his life with his own hand, did not act according to the precepts of Epicurus in cutting his throat. Some choose to regard this act as the result of madness, others of recklessness. He, meanwhile, happy and filled with the consciousness of his own goodness, has borne testimony to himself by his manner of departing from life, has commended the repose of a life spent at anchor in a safe harbor, and has said what you do not like to hear, because you too ought to do it. I've lived, I've run the race which fortune set me. You argue about the life and death of another, and yelp at the name of men whom some peculiarly noble quality has rendered great, just as tiny curs do at the approach of strangers. For it is to your interest that no one should appear to be good, as if virtue in another were a reproach to all your crimes. You enviously compare the glories of others with your own dirty actions, and do not understand how greatly to your disadvantage it is to venture to do so. For if they who follow after virtue be greedy, lustful, and fond of power, what must you be, who hate the very name of virtue? You say that no one acts up to his professions, or lives according to the standard which he sets up in his discourses. What wonder, seeing that the words which they speak are brave, gigantic, and able to weather all the storms which wreck mankind, whereas they themselves are struggling to tear themselves away from crosses into which each one of you is driving his own nail. Yet men who are crucified hang from one single pole, but these who punish themselves are divided between as many crosses as they have lusts, but yet are given to evil speaking, and are so magnificent in their contempt of the vices of others that I should suppose that they had none of their own, were it not that some criminals, when on the gibbet, spit upon the spectators. Book 20 Philosophers do not carry into effect all that they teach. No. But they effect much good by their teaching, by the noble thoughts which they conceive in their minds. Would, indeed, that they could act up to their talk. What could be happier than they would be? But in the meanwhile you have no right to despise good sayings and hearts full of good thoughts. Men deserve praise for engaging in profitable studies, even though they stop short of producing any results. Why need we wonder if those who begin to climb a steep path do not succeed in ascending it very high? Yet, if you be a man, look with respect on those who attempt great things, even though they fall. It is the act of a generous spirit to proportion its efforts not to its own strength, but to that of human nature, to entertain lofty aims, and to conceive plans which are too vast to be carried out in execution even by those who are endowed with gigantic intellects, who appoint for themselves the following rules. I will look upon death or upon a comedy with the same expression of countenance. I will submit to labors, however great they may be, supporting the strength of my body by that of my mind. I will despise riches when I have them as much as when I have them not. If they be elsewhere, I will not be more gloomy. If they sparkle around me, I will not be more lively than I should otherwise be. Whether fortune comes or goes, I will take no notice of her. I will view all lands as though they belonged to me, and my own as though they belonged to all mankind. I will so live as to remember that I was born for others, and will thank nature on this account. 
for in what fashion could she have done better for me? She has given me a loan to all, and all to me alone. Whatever I may possess, I will neither hoard it greedily nor squander it recklessly. I will think that I have no possessions so real as those which I have given away to deserving people. I will not reckon benefits by their magnitude or number, or by anything except the value set upon them by the receiver. I never will consider a gift to be a large one if it be bestowed upon a worthy object. I will do nothing because of public opinion, but everything because of conscience. Whenever I do anything alone by myself, I will believe that the eyes of the Roman people are upon me while I do it. In eating and drinking my object shall be to quench the desires of nature, not to fill and empty my belly. I will be agreeable with my friends, gentle and mild to my foes. I will grant pardon before I am masked for it, and I will meet the wishes of honorable men halfway. I will bear in mind that the world is my native city, that its governors are the gods, and that they stand above and around me, criticizing whatever I do or say. Whenever either nature demands my breath again, or reason binds me dismiss it, I will quit this life, calling all to witness that I have loved a good conscience and good pursuits, that no one's freedom, my own least of all, has been impaired through me. He who sets up these as the rules of his life will soar aloft and strive to make his way to the gods. Of a truth, even though he fails, yet he fails in a high emprise. But you, who hate both virtue and those who practice it, do nothing at which we need be surprised. For sickly lights cannot bear the sun, nocturnal creatures avoid the brightness of day, and at its first dawning become bewildered and all betake themselves to their dens together. Creatures that fear the light hide themselves in crevices. So croak away and exercise your miserable tongues in reproaching good men. Open wide your jaws, bite hard, you will break many teeth before you make any impression. Book 21 but how is it that this man studies philosophy and nevertheless lives the life of a rich man? Why does he say that wealth ought to be despised and yet possesses it? That life should be despised and yet live? That health should be despised and yet guard it with the utmost care, and wish it to be as good as possible? Does he consider banishment to be an empty name, and say, What evil is there in changing one country for another? And yet, if permitted, does he not grow old in his native land? Does he declare that there is no difference between a longer and a shorter time, and yet, if he not be prevented, lengthen out his life and flourish in a green old age? His answer is that these things ought to be despised, not that he should not possess them, but that he should not possess them with fear and trembling. He does not drive them away from him, but when they leave him he follows after them unconcernedly. Where, indeed, can fortune invest riches more securely? than in a place from whence they can always be recovered without any squabble with their trustee. Marcus Cato, when he was praising Curius and Corincanius, in that century in which the possession of a few small silver coins were an offense which was punished by the censor, himself owned four million sesterces, a less fortune, no doubt, than that of Crassus, but larger than that of Cato the censor. If the amounts be compared, he had outstripped his great-grandfather further than he himself was outdone by Crassus and if still greater riches had fallen to his lot, he would not have spurned them. For the wise man does not think himself unworthy of any chance presence. He does not love riches, but he prefers to have them. He does not receive them into his spirit, but only into his house. Nor does he cast away from him what he already possesses, but keeps them, and is willing that his virtue should receive a larger subject matter for its exercise. Book 22 who can doubt, however, that the wise man, if he is rich, has a wider field for the development of his powers than if he is poor, seeing that in the latter case the only virtue which he can display is that of neither being perverted nor crushed by his poverty, whereas if he has riches, he will have a wide field for the exhibition of temperance, generosity, laboriousness, methodical arrangement, and grandeur. The wise man will not despise himself, however short of stature he may be, but nevertheless he will wish to be tall. Even though he be feeble and one-eyed, he may be in good health. Yet he would prefer to have bodily strength, and that too, while he knows all the while that he has something which is ever more powerful, he will endure illness, and will hope for good health. For some things, though they may be trifles compared with the sum total, and though they may be taken away without destroying the chief good, yet add somewhat to that constant cheerfulness which arises from virtue. 
Riches encourage and brighten up such a man, just as a sailor is delighted at a favorable wind that bears him on his way, or as people feel pleasure at a fine day or a sunny spot in the cold weather. What wise man, I mean of our school, whose only good is virtue, can deny that even these matters which we call neither good nor bad have in themselves a certain value, and that some of them are preferable to others? To some of them we show a certain amount of respect, and to some a great deal. Do not, then, make any mistake. Riches belong to the class of desirable things. Why, then, say you, do you laugh at me, since you place them in the same position that I do? Do you wish to know how different the position is in which we place them? If my riches leave me, they will carry away with them nothing except themselves. You will be bewildered, and will seem to be left without yourself if they should pass away from you. With me riches occupy a certain place, but with you they occupy the highest place of all. In fine, my riches belong to me, you belong to your riches. Book 23 Cease, then, forbidding philosophers to possess money. No one has condemned wisdom to poverty. The philosopher may own ample wealth, but will not own wealth that which has been torn from another, or which is stained with another's blood. His must be obtained without wronging any man, and without its being won by base means. It must be alike honorably come by and honorably spent, and must be such as spite alone could shake its head at. Raise it to whatever figure you please, it will still be an honorable possession, if, while it includes much which every man would like to call his own, there be nothing which any one can say is his own. Such a man will not forfeit his right to the favor of fortune, and will neither boast of his inheritance nor blush for it if it was honorably acquired. Yet he will have something to boast of if he throws his house open, let all his countrymen come among his property, and say, If any one recognizes here anything belonging to him, let him take it. What a great man, how excellently rich will he be, if, after his speech, he possesses as much as he had before. I say, then, that if he can safely and confidently submit his accounts to the scrutiny of the people, and no one can find in them any item upon which he can lay hands, such a man may boldly and unconcealedly enjoy his riches. The wise man will not allow a single ill one penny to cross his threshold, yet he will not refuse or close his door against great riches. If they are the gift of fortune and the product of virtue, what reason has he for grudging them good quarters? Let them come and be his guests. He will neither brag of them nor hide them away. The one is the part of a silly, the other of a coward and paltry spirit, which, as it were, muffles up a good thing in its lap. Neither will he, as I said before, turn them out of his house, for what will he say? Will he say, you are useless, or I do not know how to use riches? As he is capable of performing a journey upon his own feet, but yet would prefer to mount a carriage, just so he will be capable of being poor, yet will wish to be rich. He will own wealth, but will view it as an uncertain possession which will some day fly away from him. He will not allow it to be a burden either to himself or to anyone else. He will give it, why do you prick up your ears? Why do you open your pockets? He will give it either to good men or to those whom it may make into good men. He will give it after having taken the utmost pains to choose those who are the fittest to receive it, as becomes one who bears in mind that he ought to give an account of what he spends as well as what he receives. He will give for good and commendable reasons, for a gift ill bestowed counts as a shameful loss. He will have an easily opened pocket, but not one with a hole in it, so that much may be taken out of it, yet nothing may fall out of it. Thank you for listening to this audiobook in progress. To hear more of our audiobooks in progress, please subscribe to this channel and like our videos. All of our completed audiobooks can be downloaded for free at copyleftaudiobooks.com. Thank you for listening and for your support.